Tish, check. So that one's gone. Can you hear me? You're happy? He's just looking at the phone. Yeah, I'm happy. So what you'll you'll have a shot that's either you or the guy. Oh, you're filming it. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah, one's, one's, on one's on the screen and one's on you. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> I'm sure actually probably half of New Zealand's tuning in now. Yeah. Can't wait to hear about it. Yeah. Yeah. I forget. Oh, yeah, it's working now. <laughs> well, you've got a.
Alright, everybody, I love that. <laughs> right, well, uh, thank you everybody for coming to the, the first in our uh, slightly delayed uh, spring seminar series. It's great to see you here, and uh, for those of you who are watching uh, the live stream, uh, you're also most welcome, and uh, we're glad that you're with us, if not in person, at least in spirit. Um, some basic rules for uh, the uh, people around here. First of all, could you please mute your phones before we get started? Secondly, fire exits are where the exit signs are, so please follow those and gather in the, uh, there's the two car parts, so gather there in the case of uh, emergency. Toilets, out to the right or down to the left and down the, the corridor. Um, parking, I already mentioned, we've got two car parks. If it's full at the front, there's lots of room at the side car park. Uh, anyone not a member of U3A who's interested in joining, please ask at the desk just outside. Uh, and that's all the basic details. The structure of the session, I'll introduce our speaker. She will talk for uh, or approximately 50 minutes. Uh, there's, we would normally have a tea break and so on, and people could write down questions. Unfortunately, we're not able to do that, but we will have a roving mic for questions. So after the talk, if you want to ask a question, just put your hand up and we'll get the mic to you. Uh, please wait until you get the mic, then everyone can hear what you're saying. Um, and the, uh, now the uh, version is being live streamed, as you know, there's a URL, so you or anyone else can uh, watch again at any other time. With the PowerPoint, there's, uh, if any of you actually want copies of the PowerPoint as well to look at the details, uh, you could uh, either email Graham Slater or in the next reminder that I send out to all U3A members, I'll give details his email address and you'll be able to get a copy of the PowerPoint sent out to you. Uh, okay, now it gives me great pleasure to introduce the first of our four speakers, uh, Professor Christine Stevens. Uh, and first of all, just a bit of uh, uh, background. We're very fortunate to have uh, Christine here, given her, her topic. Uh, she's worked in health psychology and health promotion, uh, focusing in particular at the moment on requirements of an aging population and the need to, f to provide information for supportive social policy and practice. Uh, now, there's something called a health uh, uh, and aging research team uh, which is running a longitudinal study of aging. It's been following older New Zealanders for or since uh, 2006, so it's a, a well-established program now. Uh, in terms of the various projects that she's been involved in, uh, current one that she's project leader is on enabling participation by older people, uh, projects that uh, she has completed, among others, uh, Aging, Housing and Health, a collaborative study, the participation of older people, independence, contribution, uh, connection, and uh, as a team member, uh, going back to oh, 2007, so she's been involved in this area for, again, for a considerable time, uh, the uh, Developing an Economics Living Standard uh, Index for Elders, New Zealand Longitudinal Study of Work, Social and Psychological Participation in an Aging Population, Enhancing Community Participation, Independence and Wellbeing. Uh, publications, also no, numerous publications naturally, including just uh, this year, one on diverse experiences among older adults in Aotearoa, uh, Aotearoa New Zealand during COVID-19 lockdown. I'm sure there'll be some interesting points to come out of that. I don't know if we'll hear any, <laughs> any of those. Uh, uh, older people as active agents in their neighborhood environments, moving house can improve quality of life. For those of you downsizing to a retirement village, maybe there's some, some pointers there. Uh, and also a book chapter, Aging Identities in the 21st Century, the social and practical effects uh, of talk about being old. So uh, numerous areas that are uh, certainly of direct interest to us. And uh, without further ado, I'll hand over to Christine to uh, talk to you about the importance of housing in neighborhoods. Okay, 
Thank you. Kia ora tato. Um, thanks very much, Stuart. I see you've been looking me up, <laughs> tricking me. Uh, some of those things I'm going to talk about. I'm not going to talk about um, the experiences of COVID, but actually that is our most recent study that we're funded to do. Understandably, um, I, uh, the, suddenly the agencies are very interested in people's experiences during the COVID lockdown, so that's the study we're engaged in right now. But my particular interest in general in terms of people's, um, or older people's well-being, is in um, housing and neighbourhoods. So that's what I'm going to talk to you about today. I am a member of the Health and Ageing Research Team at Massey University. And um, as Stuart's told you, we're studying this um, health through various projects. But first I, I want to say... Um, Thank you for coming out on such a horrible day. It's suddenly turned back to winter again today, so it's really nice. And I was just saying to Stuart that this is the first time I've talked to a live audience for I don't know how long. I wish I was a bit closer to you, so, but now we all have to keep distanced. And, um, but it's really lovely. I suddenly realised, oh, what a treat to be able to actually talk to real people and not on Zoom. Um, for a change. So well done Stuart and team for organising this, getting this together despite all the difficulties that we've had lately. Um, so the reason that I focus on housing is because it's an aspect of the environment that is increasingly um, being understood as important to the well-being of older people. And we've been examining these effects in Aotearoa to show that um, Housing tenure itself um, and housing quality are significantly related to well-being and quality of life and loneliness, which is a particular issue that a lot of agencies are interested in. So I'm going to begin with an overview of the HWR study that Stuart mentioned and show, then show some of our recent findings around older people's housing and neighbourhoods and their relationships to well-being. So this complicated looking slide is a picture of um, our longitudinal study. It's called the HWR, Health, Work and Retirement Study. And we started in 2006. And this um, shows here the movement across the waves. 2006, 2008, 2010 and so on up to 2020. And we are in the field again this year as a special wave to look at the COVID um, responses. Um, so we have been following, a, it's the same group of people, but with some refresh. Um, so in 2014, we started adding new people in at the bottom. When we started, the, um, the group was aged 55 to 70. And so as we've gone on over the years, of course, these people are getting older, which is the plan to see how they go through retirement and into older age. But at the same time, we're getting this incredibly rich um, set of data around the um, health and well-being of older people. And we want to um, keep that, that going. So we're filling in from the bottom, so to speak. So starting in 2014, we start recruiting new people around the 55 to 56 ages so that the, um, the study can keep going hopefully beyond my um, working life, because it's turned out to be quite successful. Um, I might point out that the sample is um, a national sample. We recruit people through the electoral roll, so that's how they get chosen. So it basically is a random um, selection from the electoral roll and includes anybody who's on the roll over the age of 55 um, to whatever. Um, what else should I say about it? It's um, we recruit 50% Māori, and at the moment we have about 40% Māori in the um, in the sample. So these are the um, sort of questions that we ask. Oh, I know what I didn't say. The survey is a postal questionnaire, so it goes out every two years in the post. We found that that is, having thought about telephoning, 
Um, we'd love to do face-to-face -face interviewing, but we can never um, get enough funding to do that. Other things like telephoning or Zoom interviews. The best way to get to the biggest range of people has turned out to be a postal questionnaire. Um, so in the questionnaire, we ask questions about people's health and well-being, about social support and the social context, and you'll see that I've highlighted in that little group of questions housing. We added housing in, in 2016 when I started to become interested in its importance. So it's just one of the things that we survey. And then work and retirement and income and assets and just demographic aspects of who the people are and um, what as aspects of their um, life. We can measure. So... Um, Having become interested in housing, it really was emerging as an important factor related to health early in terms of the practical aspects of housing. It's an important determinant of um, health and quality of life for everybody. And one of the first aspects that started to be paid attention to in New Zealand that I've highlighted here was the quality of the dwellings, like you know, what sort of houses you live in. And another team from Otago University did a lot of work on that, led by Philippa Howden Chapman. And that work has been terrifically successful and important. It's led to understanding that damp and mouldy housing is, is very bad for people's health, like as if you didn't know that already, but they produced the data to demonstrate that it has a big impact. So the government has incorporated that into policy now and there are a whole lot more rules about insulation and about the levels of heat that um, landlords have to provide. And all of those um, understandings and then subsequent regulations came from that work from Philippa Howden Chapman and her team. So they've led the way by looking at that practical aspects of housing. Now, although just like in the census, they now include things like, is there any mould in your house? Um, and um, how easy is it to heat your home? We've included those things as well, but we're not focusing on that because we feel that's their area of work and they've done a great job doing that. We're more interested in um, other aspects of housing that are more psychological, which makes sense because we um, are in a school of psychology. The first thing we wanted to look at was the effects of tenure types. And we started doing this work in 2016 simply because that's all we'd asked so far about housing. Do you rent your house or do you own your house is basically what it boils down to. Because it turns out to be that there are quite some quite important differences between people on um, whether they, whether you're a homeowner or whether you rent your house. Now these analyses um, for these questions about housing tenure were led by Dr Agnes Zabo and these are some publications that came out of her work with the HWR data. What they showed, and we were actually quite impressed with the um, the findings of these studies. We didn't realise how important it might be. But over time, um, the quality of life of older people generally increases, but, um, to, and only for homeowners. So that does, it doesn't work for people who are renting. And similarly, over time, as people age, their mental health improves, and depression in general goes down, but not for people who are renting. And for tenants who already have lower levels of quality of life and higher levels of depression, their symptoms just remain the same over time. Um, we also found that um, home ownership can act as a protective factor against the harmful effects of emotional loneliness on the quality of life in older age. So that was just our beginning, but we were very encouraged to go on looking at the effects of other aspects of housing. And these are the sort of things we started to um, include in our questionnaires. People's perceptions of their housing quality and people's perceptions of their neighbourhood quality. 
their housing environments and their neighbourhoods. And I'll talk to you a little bit more about what those perceptions were when we start looking at what we found. So in the next study, we looked at um, the effects of people's perceptions of the quality of housing in neighbourhoods on their physical, their mental and their social health over time. So this is where we're getting going with our serious um, look at housing. We used data in this study from um, 2006 to 2016. So we're also looking at it over 10 years from the, of the HWR study. And there were about 2,500 people included in these analyses I'm going to talk to you about. So the first thing we did is we used um, modelling to describe groups of older people who had common profiles of physical and mental and social well-being over 10 years. So that's grouping them into um, different groups who all had the same sort of trajectory across that time. And these, were, these groups, we gave them labels. So they are pictured on the, uh, the right-hand side of this, this slide here. And these are the little labels and the images that we gave for them so we could use them in our illustrations. So first of all, you've got the people in robust health. They're the red, hearty-looking people down the bottom. And that's about 30% of the sample. These are people with good, above-average physical, mental and social health. So 30%, that's a good proportion of the population that are represented here. The second group, another 30%, were in average good health. And they had slightly poorer social health than the average, but in general, they've still got good health. So now we've got 60% of the population of older people in our sample who are doing really well in terms of health. So that's one thing to keep in mind, is that older people in the um, country are generally quite healthy. But there are people we do have to worry about. And the next group up is what we call declining physical health. Now, this is the only group that changed across the 10 years. And as the label shows, their health went down. So they're probably um, the people who, at the beginning of that time, um, maybe got some illness or started to get some um, chronic illness that made their health decline across the 10 years. And that was 17% of the sample. Then we've got people with um, limitations in mental and social health. That's 12% of the sample. A smaller group, but big enough group that we should be concerned about their needs. And remember that these people came in with those limitations and so stayed pretty stable across the 10 years. And then a smaller group, 9% of the population that we called the vulnerable group, who um, had limitations in physical, mental and social health. The reasons for looking at these groups um, is because there are these smaller proportions of people with um, problems, limitations in health of various sorts, and if we averaged out all of those um, scores on health, then those people would get lost because they would get swallowed up by the 60% of relatively healthy people. So the usefulness of pulling them out like this and putting them into groups and following their track over time means that we can pay attention to what's happening to the more disadvantaged people in our society. So um, these health profiles are related to early mortality, cognitive functioning, and health-related behaviours, so that um, different groups have different out outcomes. And in general, across all those things, the vulnerable group in particular have the worst outcome. Now, what I'm showing on this gra graph is mortality, and it shows the general pattern. And it's quite... Um, I suppose, reflective of what one might expect. So you can see that the vulnerable group in blue have, are most likely to die across the 10 years. And then that's followed lower down by the people with the um, 
mental and social health limitations, and so on, until you get the robust group at the bottom who are the least likely to pass away across the 10 years. And these data show the, um, how the profiles relate to particular aspects of housing. I can hardly read that one up the back, so I'm going to have to turn around and look at it. <laughs> um, this is the percentage of those in each health profile who report satisfaction with housing and feeling safe at home. So this is satisfaction with housing, and this is feeling safe at home. Now, you can see that both graphs show the same general pattern. So let's just look at one. Satisfaction with housing, the robust health group have got, are the most satisfied, and the vulnerable people are the least satisfied. And a similar pattern for feeling safe at home. So that's how the groups um, are reflected in terms of their housing. In the next one, you'll see that, um, I'm just going to stand aside here, we've got worry about finding suitable housing, finding it difficult to maintain a home, finding it difficult to keep the house warm, and finding it difficult to keep the house clean, and um, the same pattern, only reversed this time because these are negative aspects of housing. Of the robust health group have got the least worries about all of those things, and the vulnerable group have always got the most, and the others tracking along in the same sort of, sort of orders across those aspects of housing. So, wait. So the um, vulnerable people about 46% are more likely to find their house difficult to maintain, 34% unable to keep their house warm, and 59% find their house difficult to clean. So these health factors are seem to be systematically related to people's experiences of housing and their reports of um, how they're living in their houses. Remember that most Participants report a high standard of living, but there are older people in these poorer health states to whom we can start to direct assistance. So the next thing we did is um, we related each of the profiles to differences in self-rated living standards and their perceptions of housing, and now we're adding in the neighbourhood perceptions as well as their housing. So after accounting for the effects of gender, ethnicity and age, and this is an important thing to remember, that we take out the um, aspects that are explained by those factors, because they do have effects as well, and health profile membership, we found that they are significantly related to every aspect of housing and neighbourhood. Now, this figure, it's a little bit tiny, um, but I'll try and unpack it for you just so you can get the general gist of what it's saying to us. And that is that these, these little um, coloured boxes down here represent the scores on neighbourhood security, neighbourhood accessibility, neighbourhood social cohesion, and those are the aspects of neighbourhood that we um, measured. And I'll explain a bit more about those as we go on as well and housing satisfaction as living standards. And each one of those, you can see it generally in the same direction for each of the groups. So I'll just unpack one of the groups, or two, just to show you how to make sense of this figure, I hope. Um, now, these, the scores here are standardised so that the average is zero, and that's reflected in this line here. So you can see that as the average score for each of those groups. And what we find, or the, sorry, the average score for everybody, and what we find is that the robust health people here, all of their scores on the neighbourhood and housing factors are above average. 
But if we go to the vulnerable health people, the poorest health, then we find that all of their scores on housing, neighbourhood, living standards are well below average. The average health people, as you might expect, their housing scores are hover around the average. And the um, mental and social health limitations group below, and even the people with um, declining physical health. So, who I always see as people who are doing quite well until they got whatever illness is making their physical health decline, they're starting to find difficulties with their housing and report that it's not so good. So these are, um, all in all, I hope that you take the message that these are very clear indications of strong relationships with aspects of health, with aspects of housing, and now with people's reports about their neighbourhoods. I think that's all I've got to say about that one. I'm happy to go back later if you've got any questions about particular um, aspects. Now, the World Health Organization 2015 policy framework draws our attention to the importance of the environment for older people's well-being. This is in contrast to a lot of the work that's been done in the past thinking about um, how individuals can improve their health. Now, I'm sure you've all heard all those messages. You should eat better, you should exercise, you should go out and make friends, you should do crosswords. You know all those things you're meant to be doing to keep well and healthy. And now we're turning our attention to how the environment can help um, keep people healthy. It's not all up to individuals. And that's what the World Health Organization strategy has started to turn to focus on. And specifically, they're interested in the ways that the environment can support changes in intrinsic capacity. And that's what we've added in here on this slide, housing, neighbourhood, intrinsic capacity and health. So this is what we looked at in this particular study. So intrinsic capacity means that um, the physical capabilities that change as we age. There's no denying that we start to lose capacity as we get older. I've just had a hip operation, as Stuart knows, so I'm well aware of the changes that happen to you as you age. And, um, but recognising that, how can the environment support people's capability to maintain their well-being? And this is making a difference between intrinsic capacity and um, you know, changes in your physical status, like crumbling hips, and your health. I still feel I might classify myself as a well, healthy person. So we used the um, HWR data to test the effects of older people's intrinsic capacity and their perceptions of their neighbourhood environments on changes in their general mental and physical health across two years. So we took the participants for this study, 2,910, from um, two waves of the HWR in 2016 and 2018. And we looked at um, the effects of changes in their intrinsic ca capacity alongside their perceptions of their neighbourhood on health over the two years. So the main measures are um, intrinsic capacity, which was assessed with a number of chronic conditions. So we just asked people um, about their chronic conditions, and that includes hearing loss, vision loss, and other um, chronic illnesses that people have. And neighbourhood perceptions was assessed with measures of housing suitability, Neighbourhood satisfaction. So we always ask people just, are you satisfied with your neighbourhood? And that can be quite telling. But also the specific things we ask about neighbourhoods are accessibility. And I'll explain that one now because I think I've talked about it already enough without explaining it. Neighbourhood accessibility means, are you able to access important facilities in your neighbourhood? So we ask about that in various ways. 
and then neighbourhood social cohesion, which has turned out to be very, a very telling um, aspect of neighbourhood life. So that's, do you get on with your neighbours? Do you trust your neighbours? And one of the most important aspects of that turns out to be tr neighbourhood trust. So we just, in general, we call that neighbourhood social cohesion. And then we assessed health with um, physical and mental health scores on a, um, a standard measure. So what we found was that perceptions of greater neighbourhood accessibility and more trust among neighbours were was associated with mental health, better mental health, two years later. But not to physical health, just mental health. But there was a significant interaction between intrinsic capacity and neighbourhood accessibility, remember access to facilities, on physical health over time. It showed that those reporting less accessibility in their neighbourhood experienced the stronger impact of intrinsic capacity on their physical health. In other words, people with physical conditions or loss of vision or hearing were more likely to also report lower health if they experienced poor accessibility to important facilities in their neighbourhood. So that somehow impacted their sense of how healthy they were. So this study points to the important need for accessible facilities and cohesive neighbourhoods. And that gives us some um, direction for social policy or for um, local council actions. We can now go and say, these are the most important things that are affecting people's lives in their neighbourhoods. And that's the paper that comes out of this one. Now, I'm, I keep including these papers for the people that might read these slides later and want to look up and find out more details about that. So now we're shifting the focus from um, health to quality of life as an outcome. And in this study, we focused on the ways that the important aspects of housing and neighbourhood work together. So it's an ecological perspective, as we've called it in the title here, to create livable environments that support good quality of life. So this is an image of the um, ecological model that shaped our analysis. At the individual level, that's at the very heart of the model, we considered people's socio-economic status, their health, their chronic conditions, their gender, their marital status and their age. And at the environmental level, we considered their housing and neighbourhood satisfaction, their neighbourhood accessibility and their neighbourhood social cohesion. And we also considered two what we might call more objective contextual factors, and that was whether they lived in rural or urban environments, and also the distance to the health, nearest healthcare facilities. And we chose that one, it seems like odd to suddenly add that in, but that's been telling in the um, literature overseas, just how far people have to go to get to their health facilities, and it's also one of the clear contextual indicators that we had in our other um, questions in the questionnaire. So looking at these data together, a regression equation showed that housing and neighbourhood perceptions contributed additional 5% of variance over the whole, um, all those factors in the model, which explained 49% of quality of life. So the point is that um, perceptions of housing and neighbourhood quality are important to quality of life over and above those other aspects like health, your health, your socio-economic status and other aspects of the environment, which are also important contributors to quality of life. So we don't want to ignore all those other things, but just to say housing is a significant additional explainer of people's quality of life. 
And the two aspects of the environment that were measured, that was rural versus urban and the distance to the nearest healthcare facility, were not directly related to quality of life, but they did interact with rurality and housing satisfaction. I mean, sorry, there were interactions between those things, rurality and housing satisfaction, they interacted together. And distance to healthcare interacted with perceptions of neighbourhood um, accessibility. So this, for example, um, those interactions, the uh, people living in rural environments, their housing satisfaction was more important to their quality of life. So somehow living in the country means that your house itself, rather than the neighbourhood aspects, are more important. Now, that's all we know from those sorts of data from questionnaires. So we'd have to go more closely into those environments and ask people living in rural areas why their houses are more important. We can make some guesses. I live in the country. I can think, well, I'm not thinking about neighbourhood like people in the city are. On the other hand, neighbours are important. So it's something that we might want to poke into a bit more. That's all we can say from those sorts of initial findings. Now we're looking at loneliness. Because um, the uh, age concern is very interested in loneliness and they came to us and um, age concern Kapiti in particular were interested in conducting research with older people on the Kapiti coast about loneliness. And so we worked together to develop a survey as part of their their work. Um, they, would do, they did other qualitative um, studies and community involvements as well. So we just came on board to help them with their survey. Because of my growing interest in housing and neighbourhoods, of course, I in, included that in the questionnaire. And um, this is the, uh, the details of that study. There were 919 respondents and we did it in 2019. I can't read out all those details to you, so I'll leave you to read them for yourselves. <laughs> the light doesn't shine very well on my view of the slides. But um, the important thing is really is what we found. First of all, the interesting thing was that belonging to social clubs, and we asked a lot about that sort of thing, you know, what do you belong to, what do you contribute to, do you volunteer, it had very little effect on loneliness. People did belong to lots of clubs, various organisations, of course, and volunteer, but they had very little relationship to their sense of loneliness. And these are the factors that did predict loneliness. When we put them all together into a regression equation, so they're all controlling for each other, the, the final significant predictors were marital status. Now, that's understandable. We must include this when we're thinking about loneliness. It's such a telling thing, particularly among this age group where people are often um, lately widowed and certainly, you know, we, as we can understand, has a huge impact on feelings of loneliness. So that's not a surprising one. Health also. Health limits people's lives and affects their loneliness. And family and private restricted social networks, completely expected, because these are the sort of social networks that where people are, are very restricted. And although you might be surprised about family, a family social network um, is when someone becomes dependent only on their family, their social life is closing down and they usually do express more feelings of loneliness. The thing is that the housing satisfaction, neighbourhood accessibility, neighbourhood security and neighbourhood social cohesion added, and this is at a second step, added additional explanation over and above those other aspects. So I was certainly impressed with these findings and we'd like to do more work on that as well in terms of loneliness because to me, once again, this is um, a clear signal of what we can do about loneliness. Do you know that at the moment there's a big push by age concern about relieving loneliness and there's a lot of um, interest at the moment in what um, councils and government can do. And I'm, you know, of course I'm in there saying neighbourhoods, social cohesion, 
developments, thinking about the future, how are we building housing, how do they work? So, given all that, um, you know, understanding these important relationships, we asked whether older people can improve their quality of life by moving house to somewhere better. And this was against, first of all, um, we started thinking about moving house quite a while ago because there's a background of um, interest in the meaning of ageing in place. You know, that's government social policy to support older people to age in place. And it's often taken to mean to age in the house that they've always been in, but it's not necessarily how we should interpret that. And to add it, for a start, we did a qualitative study um, with 148 people in New Zealand. And um, we found that when we interviewed these people, they fell into two groups. I'm not going to give you any numbers because this is a qualitative study and we can't say it's representative in any way of you know, what these groups represent in the population. But generally, the people who move, and as you might expect, it's not surprising, they were people who are downsizing, right? That's a classic reason to move as we grow older. Um, and to move closer to facilities, move from the country into town, move from your... Um, from out, out of the suburb into um, closer to facilities in the middle of town, a move to a more convenient, sunnier house. People spoke about those sorts of things. And moving to be closer to social connections, particularly family. A lot of older people move to be closer to their family. And so these are all not surprising aspects, and um, people did talk about moving house. But we also had people who said they would never move house, and we called those the non-movers. And in actual fact, when we um, wrote up our analysis of these data, these are the people we were most interested in because they went against what you thought might um, improve their quality of life. And we looked at... They sort of fell into three sort of types of explanations for why they weren't going to move. And the first group which I find fascinating, are what we call the pioneers. So I put that word out there, pioneering. But that was just a label we gave them. But what it, they were people who loved roughing it. So we had people living up mountains, people living up way in the country with very poor facilities like outdoor toilets. And um, when I say living up mountains, you know, that's not a good place as you lose um, mobility. And so, but these people loved struggling against nature, um, being like pioneers and being very self-sufficient and very resilient and very proud of it. And then there's people who expressed belonging socially. And that's very easy to understand. You know, they, their friends were there, their place was there, and this is where they belonged. So they weren't going to move, even if their house had seven bedrooms and was completely... Um, not suitable, they were still, um, that was the, not the important thing to them, the important thing was their social relationships. And then there were the people that belonged to a place, like they, they were rooted in the soil of that particular place, so nothing would persuade them to move either in terms of their housing accommodation. So, um, that's, um, as I said, when we wrote up these results, we just found that the people who wouldn't move were the most interesting people, and that's our, our paper from that. But still, that begs the question of, you know, does moving house improve quality of life? So we've turned to the HWR um, data to look at that. So as we already know, and as we found in this study of 3,000-odd people, um, of whom 8.2% moved house between 2006 and 2018. So it's not that many movers, but enough for us to look at the differences. And so, as I said, um, quality of life for these people was predicted totally expectedly by now by housing satisfaction, neighbourhood satisfaction, neighbourhood accessibility, neighbourhood trust, and that was controlling for age, gender, marital status, home ownership, socioeconomic status, physical health, and mental health. 
And the movers generally um, improve their environmental satisfaction by moving. Despite the other potential effects on their um, quality of life, like their differences in mental and physical health and their changes in marital status, which we thought was an important thing to control for. And those who moved house between 2016 and 2018 reported lower housing and neighbourhood satisfaction than non-movers. So over time, movers reported less decline in housing satisfaction and more positive changes on all the neighbourhood perceptions with higher perceptions of neighbourhood accessibility than the non-movers um, in 2018. So from that, we would say in general, it seems to work out well for the movers. Um, Aging in place doesn't need to mean staying in the old house, but rather staying in the community of choice. I think that's the paper for sake of completion. So just to sum up, housing and neighbourhood satisfaction, neighbourhood accessibility, neighbourhood social cohesion are linked to physical, social and mental health and quality of life and loneliness among older people. And they are linked positively so that the more satisfaction, the more accessibility, etc., the better those aspects of wellbeing are. And the important thing for us is that housing and neighbourhoods are a practical, achievable focus for policy change. And that is one of the main reasons I have shifted to focus on this area of older people's wellbeing in particular, because we can do something about it. And particularly at this point in time where neighbourhoods are being developed at a rapid rate and also there are considerations about what sort of housing for older people should be provided by government, by um, councils, by organisations. We have um, already been feeding into government policy. The Ministry of Social Development has a new ageing strategy with some focus on housing as part of it. And the Ministry of Health, the Retirement Commission, City Councils, are able to use the data that we produce as evidence for the effects of housing. But we want to do ongoing research in this area, and as well as um, you know, following our participants in the longitudinal study, we are doing work on objective assessments of neighbourhoods. So that means you go out and have um, assessors rate the neighbourhoods using a measure that we've been working on with some people overseas. And at the moment we've got um, a, a running a study that is linking those assessments all over New Zealand with loneliness and health measures in the HWR. And also we want to do more community focused work to develop age friendly neighbourhoods. I'm you know, working ongoingly with the Kabaddi Coast with both Grey Power and Age Concern. We've worked with the Napier City Council on their ageing age friendly strategy and we are open to doing more work. I was going to be talking to the Palmerston North City Council so but <laughs> thanks to COVID and all this shutting down thing, but they are starting to think about them. Um, working towards age-friendly as well in Palmerston North in a more focused way. And we also want to do more participatory research around age-friendly housing and neighbourhoods. I did have a student out in Palmerston North about to do her honours project um, talking to people about their neighbourhoods so that we can get more in-depth perceptions of what the meanings of some of these results are. But sadly, again, that one's been cancelled because of COVID because I can't send a young woman out to talk to old people in these times. So it's all just um, too complicated. But we, you know, hope that that will happen in the future. So that's us all. Oh. Yeah, that's all I had to say. Yeah, <laughs> that's, that's our team, or um, a good few of our team at work at Massey. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay, thank, thanks very much for that, Chris. And I'll throw it open to questions. 
If you put up your hand and I'll uh, bring the mic to you. Yes. Hi. I just wanted to ask what your thoughts were on the argument around green spaces disappearing, pros and cons, etc. Mm. Uh, there seems to be quite a bit of argument about it, one way or another. Uh, what do you think? How does that impact on people who can't get around? Maybe they need that green space or not. I don't know. Mm. I'm not. I haven't been involved in those arguments, so they'd just be my personal thoughts. I have no <laughs> research or anything on it. Um, I, I believe that all neighbourhoods should have access to some green space. It makes sense. In particular, green spaces that allow intergenerational people to connect. And that is one of my interests in green spaces. So parks are clearly very important places where older people and younger people can mix. And I think these are very important for neighbourhoods. And I think any developer should be forced, and that they are increasingly being required to include some green spaces in those developments. But I don't see that many um, great examples in some of the developments I've driven past lately, but I've heard that they're being required to. But I do think that they're important in that way. And I'm... There's other arguments about the uses of berms and those sorts of spaces, just small green spaces. You know, should they be community plots or gardens, for example, or should they be subject to regulation and mowing rules and all that sort of thing? I think all those are very interesting arguments that could well be um, discussed with communities. Um, but, of course, they need to be planned into these developments as well. So that's where government regulation comes in. And I'd be advocating for them every time. Some sort of space where people can mix. It's those public spaces um, in a neighbourhood that are very important. Especially for something like loneliness. Uh, in the group of movers... Is there any significant difference in satisfaction between those who move to a house in a normal residential area and those who go into a retirement village? You know, we didn't ask them about that, but that's a really good question, isn't it? And I think we should... There's quite a small, a surprisingly small proportion of people are still in, in retirement villages in New Zealand. So they do sort of wash out. You know, in that group, remember we only had 8%. So there would have been a very tiny percent that actually moved to a retirement village. So we didn't get into breaking them down in those sort of analyses. But as the um, retirement village approach grows, and we can see it mushrooming around us, and its popularity growing, then I think we have to start considering looking into that very soon. Yeah, thanks for the question. Yeah, my question is really related to that, and I live in I live in the Somerset village, mm -hmm. um, and as a very active person and involved in a lot of community things, um, and I wondered when you talked about um, the own people who own their house and people who rent, was there not any difference about people who live in shared housing? people who live, parents who live with their children and people who live in community housing, council housing, residential homes. It seems to me that there are people who don't fit into own your own or rent. You're absolutely right. And um, the, the arrangement that people have when they move into a village, which is the, what's it called, right to, right to occupy, the, we we lump them in with homeowners because of the numbers. Yeah, it's legally different, and we're figuring they have the same sense of security. However, it's a good question, and we've recently done some work for the um, Retirement Commission, 
and they asked us to break down all those because we normally, when we look at tenure, we do quite a crude cut. And once again, similarly to the last question, it is because of numbers. It's once you start looking at the number of, and we do ask those questions, we have all those data. We know exactly how many people live, um, you know, move in with parents, move in, move in with children usually, um, co-share, or have other all sorts of other arrangements, live in boats, live in caravans, whatever. But the numbers are so small that when, when we do these sort of statistical analyses, they, don't, they can't figure into it. So that's why we do those crude comparisons between renters and owners. And, but with the right to occupy situation is of particular importance for the same reason as the previous questioner, is that it's a growing number of people and whether that makes a difference is something we can start asking soon. Pardon? Okay, yep, happy to talk. Thank you for your talk, Christine. Um, my interest would lie in being able to deliver health to people who are isolated in the communities and why we don't make greater use of buses carrying health professionals to take care of these isolated communities, particularly our Māori people. Well, that's a good idea. Um, I just read the other day that the, um, the re a lot of people depend on the Red Cross to not take health professionals in, but to take people to the facilities. And so when we talk about a neighbourhood's access to facilities, that would include that sort of transport, that way anyway. Um, I can't answer your question about why we don't bus um, professionals into isolated communities. That's really one for um, the DHBs and the um, health system. But I think it's a very um, good idea. But as for getting people to the facilities, to their health facilities, transport is a huge thing. And it must, it should be taken into consideration as part of the development of neighbourhoods. And when we start looking at it down at the community level, like working with councils, for example, then this becomes a big part of it. Transport's always the issue. And of course, they are the people who can provide buses. And think about the way the buses might work as well. Yeah. Yes, we do have health shuttles, but the Red Cross, oh, what I started to think of, the Red Cross has just stopped doing it from the West Coast to some hospital in the South Island. It's like, it's diminishing instead of growing. <laughs> so that was a, um, that raised that issue for me, it made me think about people going to the health professionals. I don't quite understand how pe um, you take account of people's perceptions versus reality. So someone who's feeling depressed might find that their house is, doesn't suit them in ways that they might feel differently about if they weren't depressed. So how does your research take account of that sort of thing? Well, it doesn't. And that's a good point. Um, first of all, we do tend to trust people's perceptions for various reasons, however. That is why we've started doing those objective measures of neighbourhoods. Now, the, the work that we've done so far, we don't have um, many results to present yet, but it's taken quite a while to get people out all over New Zealand take, doing these objective measures. You know, is this a good, um, is this a good neighbourhood? along the lines that um, might not be affected by, by a, um, an objective assessor. What we, the very first news, though, I can tell you is that the objective assessments actually correlate quite nicely with the perceptions. So that's encouraging to, for us to trust people's own perceptions. But you're absolutely right, and that's such a good point. If you're feeling depressed, of course you're going to say that you're dissatisfied or yeah, feeling bad about your neighbourhood. So it's going to affect those, um, those, what we call subjective or perceptions. And that's why we're often careful to say these are people's own perceptions of their neighbourhood. 
But so far, we're starting to find they do accord with the um, objective measures. Thanks for that. One question about income. Um, I'm sure you considered income, but how did that uh, figure in your study? Yeah, we don't ever, um, we've stopped taking, we always ask people about their income, we never take any notice of it because, um, for two reasons, one is, it's always poor data, whatever you do, people don't like telling you their income, and then they lie about it anyway. <laughs> husbands and wives tell you completely different, if you match up husbands, all that stuff. And for older people, their income is much, um, they, you know, incomes are not quite the question about um, what sort of money is coming into your house. It's, it gets a bit more complicated. You know, some people have, um, if you're just living on super, that's easy, but what if you've got money in the bank and you've got other sources and you've got chunks you're drawing down every now and then? So, we've, in the early days, our colleagues did lots of work on trying to get some measure of income and it was just a huge amount of work and for my purposes, I've given up taking any notice of it. What we do use is a measure of living standards. And we found that's a really, I mean, income is largely an assessment of people's socioeconomic status. Where they stand in this society is um, really um, about their economic income or the economic standing, so we call it socio-economic status, they're kind of bound up together, and it's reflected in their living standards. And living standards has turned out to be a very good way to assess, and it's, it's turned out to be um, quite reliable way to assess people's, not their income, but the way they're living, which is what income's trying to um, tap into anyway. How rich are you economically? and living standards will do that for you. So that's what we use instead, all the time now. You, Christine, you use the term neighbourhood, but uh, I could imagine sort of older people, when they can drive, virtually say all of Palmerston North would be a neighbourhood. Once they get older and they can no longer drive, their neighbourhood shrinks. So is that a problem in your analysis? Ah, that's interesting, Stuart. <laughs> no one's ever asked me that before. What is your neighbourhood? It's one of those things where we rely on people's perceptions and once again, you know, that defines it for us. Um, if you sense... I, I would actually... You know, I grew up in Palmerston North and I would say that Awapuni was my neighbourhood, if anything. And um, when I start, people ask me questions about my neighbours... And, you know, when I say neighbourhood trust, you know, we, there's, there's a whole lot of questions about neighbourhood, my neighbours within that. I think I would start just thinking about the streets that I lived in. And usually it's like pretty well the street you live in, isn't it, when you think about your neighbourhood. And I'm thinking of it that way and imagining that our respondents are responding that way. Now I live in the country, of course, I do have neighbours and we still, we feel very close and we would call it a neighbourhood and, uh, but they are at a greater distance, so it's people's own judgment. Who thinks that Palmerston North is their whole neighbourhood? Okay, yeah, well, that's interesting. So if I was asking you questions about whether you trusted all the people, you're thinking of the whole of Palmerston North. Yeah, well, that's a very interesting question, and we'll start including that in some of our qualitative studies. Thank you. <laughs> How do people perceive their neighbourhoods? Yeah, I have a picture in my mind, and I was assuming that everyone has a similar picture. I'll, I'll, I'll throw another one or two uh, at you as well. You, you mentioned mental and social health limitations. What is social health? Ah, yes. Well... The reason that we did physical, social and mental health is because that's the World Health Organization 1948 definition of health. And we want to have this broad perspective of health, especially for older people, because of the physical limitations that old people start to suffer, we still think people can be in good health. Um, so we included social health as well. Right, so how did we measure that? We've measured it with um, a measure of social support, really. It's called um, social provisions. It's a measure of social provisions. It has 
lots of different aspects, and I think of it as tapping into social support. You know, have you got people who would help you physically? Have you got people who will help you emotionally? Have you got people you can turn to at certain times? It's, it's got a... I can't think of them all off the top of my head, but there's about six different types of provisions that it taps into with all its items. And one of them is, are you able to give social support as well? So it has these different um, versions. So that's how we've chosen to think about social health, which is an unusual one, but we wanted to um, have that more holistic view of health that the World Health Organization has been pushing and hasn't really been well taken up, even by the WHO itself, <laughs> since 1948 when they tried to define health. Quick comment about um, health, um, about social um, social contacts. One of the important things in Palmerston North is having a doctor, a doctor you can contact, and a doctor you can afford to pay for, and not some people don't. Yes, thank you. Yeah, no, it is very important. And that, I think that's why the distance to medical facilities has turned out to be such a telling little item and, and can tell you a lot about um, people's facilities. And uh, that's changing these days, of course, and that's an issue, I think, um, as that we move into a shortage of GPs and shared practices where people don't have their own GP. And in this time of um, the pandemic, people have talked a lot about the importance of the GP and I'm thinking, yeah, well, that's fine for people who've got their own GP that they trust, but that's becoming a, um, a harder thing to get. So if you've got a, your own GP, cling to them. Mine's just retired, so <laughs> yeah, I'm in trouble. Okay. You were, uh, you were talking about neighbourhoods and also about people who moved house. Now, moving house could be moving, say, to a smaller house in the same area or moving to another city. Is a, did you draw the distinction between those for people moving? No, we didn't ask. It's the same as asking whether they were moving into a retirement home. Because it was only 8%, we didn't break it down. But we can, um, we can look into our data if we need to, but we can't use it for those um, large-scale statistical analyses because the, the, um, it gets too weak. Um, you know, you can't have one person moving overseas to represent all the population of New Zealand. We're not capturing it properly if we do that. So that's where, okay. you know, the large-scale quantitative analyses can give us big picture stuff, but they don't provide all the answers and they raise a lot of questions, which we like to follow up with more detailed um, studies. So that's why it's really nice to hear your questions and make me think about those, those issues that you've raised for me today. Thank you. Thank you for your talk. I found it interesting and I, um, I wondered just how important it is for people to main contact with families. Does that show up in your statistics? Um, well, we, it's a question we could ask, but I think it's not something we've ever asked, but just off the top of my head, I think that most of us assume that families are a major source of support and that it is important. So it's not an issue that anyone's raised. I mean, of course, there are reasons that people don't maintain contact with their families or don't have families to support them in their older age. But in general, um, it's the last, they are the last people that will be there for you um, as you get into um, the later stage of needing that sort of support. But, um, mm, interesting question. How important is it? I think for that reason. Oh, another reason is the state depends on family caregiving. 
Um, all the old age caregiving at the moment is um, done largely by families, and the government relies on that. It's, um, so I guess, yeah, we, we just take it for granted. Most of our work around caregiving, which we have done some work around, is more about trying to point out how important the caregivers are, the, the needs of caregivers, and how they need more support, more community and government support, because um, they, our whole system relies on them. It's not, people have this idea that old oh, people go into care homes at the end of their life and get totally supported. But even if you go into um, care in your old age, who's there for you? Who's the person that visits you every day? It's going to be your family member if you're lucky enough to have them. But most people do. And I'll we'll even add more as things come <laughs> into my mind. In, um, in the work we've done just lately with older people during COVID and the lockdown time, I can tell you that most people, just like most people in New Zealand are healthy, most older people were quite happy during lockdown. And the people that suffered most were workers, people like nurses, people who lost their jobs, and caregivers. And that is either people who were locked in their home with their spouse who needed intensive care and had lost you know, contact with other forms of support, or people who were shut off from their loved one in a, a um, care home and couldn't go to see them anymore. And they were the, um, the people that had the most difficulties during the lockdown. I would have thought in lockdown the people who suffered most would be particularly small employers, you know, desperately trying to keep a business going, um, kids at home, all of that sort of thing. Yeah, not so many people in our age group. Okay. So we're talking about older people. Okay. So sure, I agree with you, I'm sure they're the worst. <laughs> I have students who are working, got kids at home, trying to do a PhD, you know, like, they're, they're even more suffering there. No, among older people, um, and there is the people who lost their job, it's the worst for them if they are, um, say, approaching 65, because they know they're not going to get another job, or the difficulties of getting another job, having lost their job. Um, so it's sort of telling. So not thinking about the rest of the population who, of course, have got their own, all their own worries as well. OK, if there's no more questions, I'll hand over to the head of Manawatu U3A. Uh, Thank you very much. Thank you, Christine, for an interesting and very thought-provoking um, session. It's a great way to open this. I was really pleased to see that you um, used a mail out to get the information out. So often our age group are ignored in that everybody assumes we're online the whole time, that we're all hooked to Facebook. I think you got better statistics, better data by actually having a, a mail out that younger people probably would totally ignore. But when you're looking at this, this age group, I think, I think it was a really, a really good shot. Mm. I'm really pleased that question that came from that lady about GPs and doctors. I mean, in this city, it's an appalling situation where shared practices mean you toss a coin when you want to see a doctor as to whether you can get to see them and who you can get to see. I think it's an absolutely appalling situation. I don't know how the hell we solve it, but it's, it's got a, a long-term implication, I think. Um, I'd also like to thank you guys for being here today. We broke a bit of, a bit of history today in that we've been online. We've, been drifting in and out between seven and eight people watching us, but the thing's recorded, and so I expect that other people will um, lock into it later on. I'll certainly have a look at it again later on. Anyway, Christine, on behalf of the U3, I'd like to thank you very much for your presentation. Oh, thank you. And um, look to hear further from the, the sort of uh, feedback that your uh, that your studies are creating. We're here again next week. We're here for the next three weeks. Sorry.
Well, thank, thank you very much. I'll just say before you carry on with your notices, it's been a great pleasure. And thank you so much for your thought-provoking questions. And um, just lovely to talk to some people face to face, <laughs> <laughs> even if I am up on the stage. <laughs> I'll leave you to do it. Okay. With so your we, we'll be here again at the same time, same channel next week. Um, as I say, it's, it's online. You can have a look at it on the URL that was sent out by Stuart. So if you want to have another look. Um, also, I've got a copy of the PowerPoint if you want to um, have a look at that up close. Um, we found that the PowerPoint washed itself out a wee bit in the, in the ambient lighting that was here. So I've got a copy of it. If anybody wants it, um, send me an email and I'll, and I'll post it back to you. See you all next week. Thank you very much.